Comrades, good afternoon. I hope I'm audible. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome for joining us. We are two minutes past 12 o'clock, uh, just allowing the song to uh, come to its nice conclusion. I was actually enjoying it. So I just thought it would really just be wrong on many levels for me to try and cut that song whilst it was uh, playing, saying that umuya uh, wam uya vuma. Uh, uh, and a uh, quite appropriate uh, uh, tune, I would say. Well, today's Mkhabolo dialogue is looking at the subject around young people in the ANC's renewal agenda. Uh, we themed it specifically around the Progressive Youth Alliance, the PYA, and the uh, uh, renewal agenda. And let me upfront also start by thanking our speakers for agreeing uh, to join us. Uh, uh, some of them certainly no uh, a stranger to this platform and uh, the others also having other leadership responsibilities within the Oak Tambo school uh, fold uh, particularly in our board but also uh, i mean you know the the place in society goes way beyond just being on Oak Tambo school uh, having a very long history in this particular kind of spaces that we seek to be talking to today so to comrade Karabo uh, Mohale, who unfortunately also can't be with us the whole time because she's in between other meetings. So good afternoon to you, Comrade Karabo, and then Kepense, uh, our regular uh, participants on this platform. 
Comrade uh, Kifenza Mkari, good afternoon to you, uh, uh, my leader. And then Sengiwe, Comrade Masengi, Comrade Masengi Bengu Mutsiri, no stranger to many of us. Uh, uh, also, welcome to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for making the time to join us. Now, as I said that today's theme, oh, by the way, my name is JP Low. Uh, I am um, editor of Mkhabulo and I am also responsible for the communication function in our Tambo School of Leadership. I see Comrade Ruby Malibe showing us his pretty face there. Uh, Comrade Ruby, ordinarily one wouldn't mind, but because we are in these trying times about uh, uh, bandwidth and so on, I'm, I, want to, I want to appeal to everybody, please keep your uh, video off. When you do have to speak later, we'll ask you to put on your video as you speak. Uh, as well. So please keep your video up and also uh, ensure that your uh, device shows your name and surname. If you want to contribute in the discussions later, we will unfortunately not be able to give you the floor unless we're able to see your name and surname and you're also able to switch on your video. Now, comrades, as I was saying that today's um, theme, our discussion, uh, we thought that we would spend the rest of November continuing around the subject about ANC renewal quite appropriately, of course, with National Conference on our doorstep uh, in the month of December. So today we're looking at the Progressive Youth Alliance, the PR, PYA in the ANC's renewal agenda. And what we're hoping through our interaction will achieve in discussion. Well, the, the, the one uh, part is sort of like just to learn from history, if you like, and also learn from others around the world where we're asking the question that uh, insofar as the role of young people in the renewal of progressive formations uh, is concerned, insofar as that is concerned, are the lessons for us to learn if you look back in our own history? I mean, is it really the first time ever that we talk about renewal in the ANC? And if renewal happened before, what was the uh, role of young people in it? And also to ask whether there are other international cases we can make reference to uh, that we can learn from uh, for ourselves. The second point of discussion is uh, uh, when we look at the current content of what we define as ANC's renewal agenda, does that content properly represent young people's interest and their concerns? You know, can we see how when we talk of ANC renewal, we are also addressing all of the things which historically we've said uh, are issues of concern uh, to the youth of, 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 of our country. And then uh, the, the last one, going specifically into the Progressive Youth Alliance itself, the PYA, it's asking whether the PYA is capacitated and is also sufficiently organized to properly champion the voice of young people in ANC's renewal agenda. So is the PYA capacitated and sufficiently organized to properly champion the voice of young people in ANC's renewal agenda? So those um, are, if you like comrades, the uh, areas of discussion that we would like to uh, venture into, uh, looking a bit at lessons, uh, asking whether the content of what we are doing, is it aligned? Uh, to what it should be doing. And then thirdly, just looking at issues of capacity, whether uh, uh, our uh, comrades that we would ordinarily entrust to be the voice uh, in this regards of the issues we are raising, are they capacitated to play that role that they ought to be playing? And if not, of course, what are the things that needs to happen as we look into the future? I want to also welcome Comrade Tsipogas uh, from uh, Owar Tambo School, uh, who is here also to support me. Uh, if anything goes uh, left here, she would have to just make sure that uh, our engagements continue. Let's say I get, get cut for whatever reason, uh, probably more load shedding than anything else. We're going to start with a board member of uh, Owar Tambo School. Like I said, Comrade uh, Garabo is with limited in terms of time. Comrade uh, Garabo uh, Mahale, who holds a Master's of Arts in Development Studies. Uh, that she did at University of Sussex uh, in the United Kingdom. She uh, is serving uh, on the ANC, uh, uh, the, 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 the ANC Youth League NYTT, and is also the executive deputy chairperson 
of the NYDA, the National Youth Development Agency. And as I said, uh, Comrade Karovo also is actually my boss because she also serves on the board of uh, our Tambo School. Comrade Karabo, uh, in about 20 minutes, uh, we hope you can serenade us with some thinking around this framework we've established. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And let me greet uh, the comrades that are on the platform, the leaders of the ANC, the Mass Democratic Movement, the Progressive Youth Alliance in its different manifestations and levels. Um, and um, let me just appreciate the OR Tambo School of Leadership for this opportunity. I really must say, Program Director, that it is always, always very difficult, especially as a young person, to speak about um, intergenerational discourses, um, whether you're saying young people need to be accommodated in the space, whether you are speaking about the role of young people in movements, uh, liberation struggles across the board. It's always quite difficult because more often than not, those that are currently leading the system often feel as if it is a direct attack um, on, on their person um, because they are a bit far older and perhaps young people are becoming a bit more impatient um, with, with the current status quo. But I want to say, Program Director, that over the years and over the discussions that we've been having, this has definitely eroded the quality of discussions we have because of the defense mechanism that either party has. Whether old people are saying, you know, the young feel that we're too old. Yes, you know, we've got experience. We've got a lot to contribute. And on the other side, young people are also having their own issues with those that are that are that are leading the organization or even different spheres um, in the economy. That has eroded the quality of discussions that we have because we never really have an accurate appreciation or a reflection on the role that different generations can be able to play in different spheres, whether of government or even in the in the economy. So it is important for us to have these types of conversations around how we can be able to ensure that the intergenerational discourse does not erode in how we handle it, but we're rather more reflective, you know, especially when we look at the demographics of the country. Stats SA advises us that the mean age in South Africa is, is 28. So when we're looking at a South African, we're looking at a 28-year-old. 20, what does that mean to us as a movement? What is that saying to us as a movement? We often reflect that you know most people that are leading the National Executive Committee of the ANC at this current point, you know, when they were elected in 1991, that is close to um, 31. It's actually 31 years ago. Most of them were actually in their youth, but it happens that the more people, you know, progress in particular structures, they feel the need to not open up space for other young people to assume certain responsibilities. And intergenerational discourses are important because we need to be able to build ageless movements. What does that mean to us when we're building an ageless movement? It means we're building a movement that does not die when its leaders die. So it's important for that intergenerational experience, intergenerational knowledge Anyone? to be taken I... from those who are a bit senior to those who are a bit, a bit younger so that they are able to learn and understand some of the invaluable experiences that those that came before us have learned. Because the minute we become a bit defensive, we then even curtail the learning process. We put a block, you know, or a fence between ourselves and those who are a bit older and were unable to exchange ideas, were unable to exchange knowledge and experiences that when they were younger, you know, what, what is it that they have learned? What is it that they can be able to teach us? Because it's not always everything that meaning that you, you must be the first one to experience it. It's not always the case, you know, we must always remember that there were those that went ahead of us. And those lessons for me become important for us to be able to learn from, from, from comrades that have went, that have went before us. Um, I believe, um, uh, program director, that um, the ANC needs to start reflecting, especially when we're speaking about renewal. It needs to start having a deliberate reflection on the demographics of the country holistically, not only looking at, at, at young people per se, but also looking at women, looking at the queer, looking at persons with disability, 
and marginalized bodies. Representation is important. You cannot build a movement that is relevant to the masses if you don't reflect their demographics, if they don't see themselves in you. And that is a reflection that we, we need to be able to, to have. We need to start acclimatizing to the lexicon and the discourse of current day. You know, when young people are speaking about TikTok, when young people are speaking about different social media platforms, we need to be able to understand that each generation will grow. And when it grows, it comes about with different ways that it interacts. It's no longer about us writing telegrams you know now people can 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 text each other on social media now the organization itself can be able to communicate on social media so we need to be able to adapt to the current um, dynamics of today in so far as how people relate in general in the country so that we're able to to remain relevant I think it's important uh, program director and comrades that when we're speaking about the progressive youth alliance we remember that we are speaking about this 66 percent you know um, that is under the age of, of of 35 that is what we are speaking about and we need to be able to center young people um especially when we're speaking about about renewal we cannot leave young people behind. they actually need to be at the center they need to be able to advise us on what is it that 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 what that they think about when you're when you're thinking about renewal you know when you look at a renewed organization how what does it look like you know when you are when you are looking at the anc whether it's today whether it is tomorrow as a young person what do you want to see what do you want to see it representing and those voices of young people who are in grassroots levels young people who are considered to be in peripheral act economic activity those young people's voices need to be heard because those are the young people that will be able to assist us to shape an organization that is ageless that is timeless that really brings on you know all of the voices of those that are not ordinarily considered to be in the mainstream the mainstream discourse i think it's important uh, program director that as much as we're speaking about intergenerational uh, uh, work and um, there's always one thing that we're passionate about in the in the anc women's league which is which is the question of of, of inter intersectionality we, we also need to be consistent in, in, in how we approach um, you know, deficiencies or rather our weaknesses in the organization. Renewal requires us to be honest. It requires candor. You cannot be able to renew the organization if you are not honest about some of the weaknesses that we have as, 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 as an organization. We need to start ensuring that as and when we grow as a movement, we build a socially conscious movement whose leaders imbue the spirit of selflessness, even in their different functionalities um, um, in, in, in the movement itself or even in, in, in government. We need to be able to understand, we need to be vulnerable to ourselves as an organization. We need to be able to sit and say, this is where we are, this is where we have been, and this is how we believe that we can be able able to change the discourse. Many discourses, um, as, as you would have correctly put it, when it's, or even on international space, many discourses, whether you are looking at the 1976 um, uprising, whether you are looking at the Arab Spring, you come back to South Africa, fees must fall, many discourses were led and are still led by young people. That says to us that young people in the main are agitators for change in our communities and in our societies. And so the organization needs to be able to be aware of some of those nuances that come with young people being at the center of certain discourses. We often lament that the organization has divorced itself from its members. And that's because when most people who are young in the main look at the ANC and its leaders, they do not see themselves in the ANC. They do not see, you know, whatever aspirations it is that they have in the ANC because they, they believe that because they are not represented, it means that there is a deafened voice of young people in excellence of the ANC that should ordinarily be speaking um, for them and, and speaking on, on, on their behalf. So it is important for us to always consistently reflect that as much as we would want to say, you know, the organization is not a particular member, 
members or society in general, when it looks at the organization, it looks at the organization through the lens of the leaders of the organization. There is no other barometer that people in South Africa can be able to use to evaluate the ANC if it's not through its members, and its leaders and therefore it is important for us to ensure that the ANC assumes the character that is impeccable and the only way you can be able to do that is to ensure that the leaders of the organization are as such they are impeccable of course this does not mean that uh, you know leaders of the ANC will not air because at the end of the day leaders are still people but even in their airing we know that we hold them to a different standard that we would ordinarily hold members so it is important for us to be able to reflect on that particular discourse to say that our leaders especially now that we're going to to, to, to the ANC conference um, uh, in December. You know, young people are always laughing that this December, uh, this is on a lighter note, uh, program director, that Ilashili, you know, that literally anybody and everybody sees themselves as a leader of, of the ANC. And that should worry us that when you are looking at the contestants, of course, you might not have a barometer, uh, especially if because, you know, there's just a heightened level of factionalism in the organization. But when you look at the, the candidates, you often sit and wonder what contribution is it that these certain people have made not only to the organization, but to their communities. And I think where we need to be able to enter into is the criteria we have in the organization uh, for people to be able to lead, whether on a national level or provincial level or even on a regional level. You know, gone are those days where a timestamp tells us that you are fit and proper. You know, when you look at when you look at the criteria, it will say to you, you need to have been a member for 10 years and it ends there. I think this is a perfect moment. You know, in every life of each organization and each movement, you get to a point where you start saying, maybe this criteria that we have put forth is not sufficient for us to be able to build an organization that rises above and is able to lead society. So it is very important for us to start reflecting around what is it that we put in place as a criteria for those that are in the organization to, to, to be able to lead. That timestamps are no longer sufficient. We need to be able to transcend the fact that a person has a membership card for the past 10 years because I could have been a member, but a dormant member, not doing anything. But today I can be able to stand up and say, you know, I want to lead the ANC as, as this or that uh, position. This conference time uh, program director has also, you know, um, given us a sense. And I think the, 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 the former deputy president, comrade uh, Khalima Mohante, wrote a scathing letter about, about money and patronage politics in the organization, you know, how, how we use money to contest for, for positions. So this essentially means that if you are poor, irrespective of what contribution you can potentially make in the organization, you will never be able to lead because we have centered contestation around who can buy who and to what extent can that person be bought. And that reflection, you know, as, 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 as the former deputy president was making, needs to be able to start with us as, on branch level as well as individual members of, of the ANC that what type of organization are we building um, there was a reflection, I think we were sitting at a political school of the ANC Youth League that more often than not, you know, we blame members, not really members, we blame leaders for buying delegates, right? But we never scrutinize the type of delegates that we have, because if you are a true member of the organization and you believe in the ideals of the organization, why are you allowing yourself to be bought? So it is a double-edged sword that you've got the buyers and you've got those that allow themselves to be bought. And that alone says to us, we need to be able to ensure that we build an organization that can be able to effectively deal with some of these challenges. And I'm raising these challenges because when you are speaking about the Progressive Youth Alliance, you are speaking about young people who are still growing in the movement. You know, some of them just joined the organization yesterday. Some of them will join the organization tomorrow. So when you inculcate them into some of these politics that are erosive to the soul of the organization, you will not be able to change 
after a certain time, the type of character that the ANC has. So if you baptize young people into patronage politics, if you baptize young people into gatekeeping, if you baptize them to some of the ills that we see that are happening, some of the weaknesses that are happening in the organization, it means that that is the type of, of, of young people that you're building. Those are the leaders that, that, that you are grooming for tomorrow because you cannot be able to groom young people to be certain things when you are not giving them whatever it is that that that, that needs to be given. So if you need a, a leader that has got integrity, it means that the leaders of today in the ANC must have integrity so that young people can be able to learn from their leaders that this is how we need to be. This is how sharp we need to be. This is how we need to be able to put to put forth whatever arguments it is that we have towards a particular discourse. But if you don't have that in the ANC, you then have a challenge where young people get initiated into incorrect politics. And I suppose this is why it's important for the Oral Tambo School of Leadership to start reflecting on the role it can be able to play, especially on political education and mass, because that is very important, that there must be political education, both for the individual and for the branches. So it's not just that you must say the PEC or the REC must go to political school. It must be political school for both the individual and the branch and the region and the province, as well as the national level. So that as, as and when you, 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 you inculcate certain principles, of the organization, you do not leave the members behind. Members become leaders, so it is important that we do not leave, we do not leave uh, uh, members uh, behind. But not all is lost, uh, uh, a program director. Uh, I'm just going to try and ensure that I sum up because my time is is is, is running out. Not all is lost. Um, a program director that in the process as we as, as we're transcending you know having leaders that do the bare minimum and 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 you know building leaders of the anc that are beyond reproach we must also be able to ensure that we put mitigating strategies in place to de-risk the organization uh, uh, from its vulnerabilities, you know, to de-risk de the organization, especially from, from, from factions and how factions in the, in the, in the ANC have, have, have gotten to a point where they live beyond conferences. You know, when we're entering the youth, we're always told that, you know, in order for the organization to, to live post every conference, factions must die. But we have now seen a trend where factions actually live beyond beyond conferences and that has got a dire impact on 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 the life of the organization so what then become some of the recommendations uh, that we believe we need to make beyond us building a socially conscious movement uh, that that reflects the, the demographics of, of 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 the country it's important for 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 the anc to ensure that it creates a conducive environment for marginalized bodies to participate in 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 the organization it's important for the organization to entrust young people women the queer persons with disabilities with responsibility there is no better way to train a young person or a woman or you know a marginalized body than through giving them an opportunity so that they can be able to learn on the job and the reason you do that is so that when they make a mistake when they earn their responsibility you are there to hold their hand and say this is where you have had but this is how you can be able to do better uh, in the future. There must be a process that broadens the parameters of what, what it means for structures and individuals to be in good standing. I think we need to be able to ensure that we hold the membership and the leaders of, of, of this, this organization to different standards. Gone are the days where, you know, for you to lead, you just need to be a member. We need to be able to ensure that there is political education for both individuals as well as, as, as as the, the, the branches and its leaders, there must be evidence um, of community work and consistent community engagements. You know, there's just a, a, an incorrect um, you know, uh, process that takes place that we only have community meetings when it's time for us to be able to, when it's time for us to elect uh, uh, councillors in that particular branch. And I think we need to be able to start to say, we need to be in constant communication with our communities so that we're able to understand the challenges of the communities. We're then able to ensure that we play a meaningful role in changing the material conditions of, 
of the lives of those that are marginalized. But um, I think beyond everything, uh, the rigorous political education, um, I think there, there is that process where it says for you to be a counselor, you need to be able to have gone through this rigorous process. We can be able to put that even for members and, and, and leaders as well. But I think um, uh, because of, of, of time, I just want to, to end by saying that we cannot be able to change where we are as an organization, some of the weaknesses that we have, if we don't want to be conscious of our weaknesses, if we don't want to be conscious of our vulnerabilities. Uh, an identified problem is often said that it is half solved. But if you misdiagnose the problem because you refuse to be honest about some of the weaknesses that you have as an organization, you will not be able to effectively deal with some of those challenges and ensure that the outcome of whatever interventions it is that you put in place, you know, rises uh, the, the organization, its members, so that when society looks at us, they look at credible leaders. When the society looks at us, they look at people who carry their hopes and aspirations and beyond carrying their hopes and aspirations we can be able to deliver even on on, on some of the promises that we have made uh, to 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 the people so with those few words uh, program director uh, thank you very much uh, for 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 this opportunity to contribute to this particular conversation thank you uh, comrade Carl. thanks for your input and a number of interesting points you 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 are raising uh, amongst others this notion of an ageless movement. Uh, we pretty much like that line of thought and even how you further define it uh, as the framework of how we keep this uh, uh, organization of us sustained into the future. I just want to appeal again uh, for those who are on the platform, if you could please show your name and surname on the device. If you don't know how to do it, you can just write directly to me or to Sipo Kazi, Comrade Sipo Kazi, who will gladly assist you. But just the rules on this platform, comments that later when you want to speak, we'll want to see your video. And as you also switch on your video, we will then give you admission to speak. You can unmute yourself. Uh, the host has to give you permission to be unmuted. So, uh, and I'm sure you'd appreciate that we do need to enforce those sorts of uh, rules just to make sure that we have some order on our platform. And we deliberately uh, having this engagement in this fashion where everybody is in the Zoom platform because we want to create sort of like a context of us sitting in a meeting, as opposed to the, I think it's called the seminar version, where you would all be on one side and you only have the two or three speakers uh, on the platform, but we need each other just to make sure that this works well uh, uh, for everyone, so please if we can appeal to you in that regard. Now, let's go immediately to our next speaker, uh, Comrade, Kifense, Comrade Kifense Mkari, who comes from the province, other, uh, others like to jokingly refer to it as the province that's in Southern Zimbabwe, uh, who comes from Limpopo uh, province, the Waterbeck uh, district to be a, a, a certain or to be specific, and is an NC Youth League and YCL member in what, 32 uh, of Mohalakwena, uh, which is in the uh, Waterbeck. He was a member of SASCO, the South African Students uh, Congress, so certainly part of the PYA uh, fold. He was a member there uh, at Vets Branch and also served on the BTT uh, at that same university. And in 2016, 2017, uh, Comrade Kefense was the president of the SRC uh, at Vets University has uh, been quite a, a leading uh, voice and role player in the FISMAS Fall movement, uh, particularly at Bates University, and uh, is a founder and CEO of Makandeni. Now, Makandeni is a projects management research and marketing company, uh, which he has founded in 2018 and uh, has been an independent analyst, thought leader, and also professional speaker uh, defines himself as an activist uh, at heart. Uh, I certainly have had uh, Comrade Pifenza making inputs on these platforms and can attest to some of uh, 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 these um, uh, uh, attributes that's outlined to him. Comrade Pifenza, today, as opposed to five minutes, we have a whole 20 minutes uh, to engage us around our subject matter. Good afternoon to you again, my leader, and welcome. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Comrade JP, for that uh, humble introduction. Um, allow me to first and foremost appreciate the opportunity by the OR Tambo School of Leadership for providing me the opportunity to contribute to these important discussions. Um, as I've said last week, that um, we are here out of the passion of these discussions we're having here. We're here out of the importance of this discussion in reshaping and renewing the ANC. Uh, let me extend my greetings to comrades in the space, to the fellow speakers that uh, I'm speaking with, and also appreciate com uh, Comrade Karavo's input. Uh, also extend my greetings to the leadership of the school, as well as comrades that are joining us on Facebook and say peace be unto you. Um, I'm going to contextualize uh, my input in the following way. One, I'm going to try to describe what the Progressive Youth Alliance is. Secondly, I'm going to you know, do a little bit of a historical analysis and the available lessons that we can learn from that particular analysis. Fourthly, I'm going to um, you know, describe the role of the PYA or what I think should be the role of the PYA in the renewal agenda. Fifthly, I'm going to sort of analyze the current state of the PYA. And lastly, I'm going to give recommendations. Uh, I must say, Comrade JP, that I had intended to share a presentation. However, given the length of the time that I'm given to speak and the research that I have done, uh, I think it will need a little bit of tweaking so that you know, uh, one is able to speak within the time allocated. So um, the first question therefore to ask is to say, what is the Progressive Youth Alliance? And I define the Progressive Youth Alliance in the following three points. One is that it's an alliance of progressive youth organizations that consciously or subconsciously are committed to the advancement of the national democratic revolution and therefore accept the Freedom Charter as a defining and guiding document of the society that the NDR seeks to achieve. Secondly, this alliance politically influences, mobilizes, and develops the youth in its diversity to play an active role in advancing the national democratic revolution and thus play a critical role politically in advocating, safeguarding, and advancing the interests of the youth in the context of the national democratic revolution. This is to say that you know, um, the Progressive Youth Alliance is not just an alliance of, you know, uh, uh, organizations of young people, but it's an alliance of progressive alliance, which are committed to the advancement of the National Democratic Revolution. And even as it advocates and advances and safeguards the interest of the youth, it does it in the context of the National Democratic Revolution. As young people, we have many interests, and some of them are inimical to the objectives of the National Democratic Revolution. So it is therefore important that in our advancing and advocating of youth interest, we do make sure that these interests in of themselves are advancing the revolution. As, and lastly is to say that consciously the PYA recognizes and accepts the ANC as the leader of the National Democratic Revolution and hence influences and mobilizes the youth to support the ANC for as long as it plays its leadership role to, to advance the strategic objectives of the National Democratic Revolution. Now here is to say that in as much as the Progressive, Progressive Youth Alliance recognizes that the ANC is the leader of the revolution, but in its role to influence and mobilize young people to support the ANC, it is not doing it in a blanket check. And therefore, it seeks to influence the ANC so that it is able to play an effective role in advancing this revolution. And therefore it is in that context that it would mobilize and influence young people to support the ANC. So it's very important to highlight that the mobilization of youth that the PYA does for the support of the ANC is not on a blanket check. It is predicated on the fact that the ANC has to play the leadership role correctly and effectively in advancing the strategic objectives of the National Democratic Revolution. And then secondly, is to try to define who is the PYA. Currently, the PYA is made up of the ANC Youth League, the South African Congress, uh, the South African Student Congress, the Young Communist League, COSAS, 
Hosatu Young Workers Forum, uh, the woman, uh, the young woman's desk, Amayanga Yang. And I would like to contend that further, the Progressive Youth Alliance must be composed of any youth organization that fits the description that I've given about. Any youth organization that believes in the objectives of the National Democratic Revolution and is committed to advancing those particular objectives. Uh, for example, at VETS, uh, when we define the Progressive Youth Alliance, uh, at the time where I was active in student politics under the banner of SASCO, uh, and of course the Progressive uh, Youth Alliance, all of the organizations, the composition of the PYA was the ANC Youth League, the Young Communist League, uh, SASCO, as well as the Student Muslim Association. So you can see that we were able to identify that the Student Muslim Association believes in the course of advancing the National Democratic Revolution, and therefore it ought to be part of the Progressive Youth Alliance. And other structures that we could give examples of are the student or youth chapters, uh, uh, youth chapters of the Progressive uh, Professional Forums, uh, B, 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 BMF, uh, APSIP, and, and, and other organizations that fit the description that I gave up, uh, above. And a historical analysis. I would like to begin my historical analysis of a radical youth, is, uh, uh, youth involvement in the ANC from the formation of the ANC Youth League. And then secondly, I would look at the period after the banning of the ANC Youth League is uh, between 1960 up until the 1980s. Then look at you know, uh, the youth involvement in you know, uh, our journey towards winning the democracy that is, you know, uh, in the late 80s up until 1994. And then look at the role of youth in the democratic dispensation uh, right, right up until, you know, the emergence of COVID. So when we look at the formation of the ANC Youth League, we're looking at the period of the 1940s up until perhaps the 1960s, just uh, at the time the ANC is banned. So the ANC Youth League was officially launched in 1944 by a generation of Abo Antony Lambert, uh, A.B. Mda, Walter Sisulu, Comrade Tambo, and Comrade Nelson Mandela and others. And these were young progressive intellectuals and professionals. The ANC was formed as a response to objective and subjective political and socioeconomic challenges that were affecting the Blacks and the Africans in particular, and the ANC as an organization at the time. Um, Making this point, one uh, uh, speaker uh, makes the following uh, observation. He says that there were two distinct factors that created the conditions for the formation of the ANC Youth League. First, it was the worsening economic situation of the African present, uh, uh, peasantry and the working class, which conditions resulted in the deterioration of the quality of their lives. The second factor was the weak state in which the organization of the ANC found itself. The organization found itself in conditions that could not respond, uh, that it could not respond uh, to, to because of its leadership and organizational incapacities. So we can argue from this particular observation and contention that we ourselves uh, find ourselves at the very same point in which the ANC Youth League found itself when it formed, you know, uh, when it formed. We can see that the quality of lives of particularly Black peoples and uh, Black people and Africans in particular, which are the motive forces of the revolution, is deteriorating. And we can obviously see the weaknesses of the ANC, uh, which start right at the leadership and, you know, the, the organizational incapacities, which we have largely spoken about in this platform. Now, what were the contributions of the ANC Youth League in the ANC at that particular time? Through its 1944 manifesto, the ANC Youth League was able to reshape the ideological posture of the ANC by arguing for African nationalism, which was underpinned by Marcus Garvey's philosophy for Afri uh, Africans for Africa, meaning you know, uh, Africans must provide African solutions and those solutions to African challenges must be advocated and led by African leaders themselves. The ANC Youth League was able to argue for an advanced, uh, uh, it was able to argue an advanced 
positions expressed in, in its manifesto to find expression in ANC's program of action of 1949, which repositioned and reconfigured the ANC and how it conducted the liberation struggle. I'm sure we're all aware of that history in which you know, the program of action of 1949 sort of shaped and repositioned how the ANC uh, conducted its struggle. Secondly, with a strong leadership, the ANC Youth League was able to, within five years, assert its leadership and authority in the ANC with key elements of it, its manifesto forming significant parts of the ANC's program of 1949. The ANC was able to ensure youth representation in the leadership echelon of the ANC to advance and safeguard its generational mission of freedom in our lifetime. For instance, you had the election of a uh, comrade or Tassi Sulu uh, as the secretary general of the ANC in 1949, just to ensure that their program and their generational mission as they defined found expression and was safeguarded within the ANC itself. The ANC Youth League was able to restore you know, ANC's legitimacy and public confidence as a progressive organization that is fit to advance the liberation struggle against apartheid, which resulted in the gain of membership and support for the ANC as a result. And lastly, this process led to very important developments in the liberation struggle. For instance, you had the compilation and adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1955. So these are some of the victories, you know, and significant contributions of the ANC Youth League as a component of the Progressive Youth Alliance to the ANC. And of course, when we move away from that history, you, you have the ANC being banned, which sort of creates a leadership vacuum, particularly for young people. But at the time you have an emergence of, you know, the black conscious movement, and you have the formation of SASO, you know, uh, 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 at the Natal University in 1968, which was very crucial in galvanizing young people in the absence of the ANC Youth League. And as a result led to the 1976 uh, revolts um, and afterwards the formation of COSAS in 1979, uh, in 1979 to ensure that, you know, uh, the interest of young people was still safeguarded in the liberation struggle. And from its formation, COSA has called for, for a national youth Congress movement that was able to galvanize all young people in society. And then you had the formation of the South African uh, Youth Congress, which you know, UDF played a very crucial role in uh, ensuring that particular formation. And this particular youth was the one that played a very important role in ensuring that they respond to the call to render the apartheid government ungovernable. You know, we speak of a period of easy damli law and young people responding to that particular call. And as a result, in 1985, you had the ANC declaring that particular year as the year of the youth, having recognized the significant contribution they had made to the liberation struggle within South Africa. You know, and then of course this led, you know, to the period of negotiations and the relaunching of the ANC Youth League, which was very important. You know, and it is this organization, particularly it was a uh, psycho, COSAS, uh, you know, uh, SANSCO, um, uh, and, and the, the youth wing of the ANC in exile, which played a very crucial role in ensuring the relaunching of the ANC Youth League. And that particular relaunching was very important because it was able to galvanize young people towards the ANC and therefore make them understand why it was important to negotiate, even when the ANC Youth League itself did not fully agree with the negotiations because it felt that the ANC was compromising too much. But however, it played a crucial role in galvanizing society, particularly the youth in supporting the negotiations and therefore the ANC. And then of course we get into the democratic dispensation and young people are still playing a very active role in shaping the politics of the ANC and even you know, asserting its authority and legitimacy in society and advancing the national democratic revolution in different spaces. And a very important period is the 2011 conference of the ANC, which declared the generational mission economic freedom in our lifetime. 
Why was this important? This was important because for the first time since 1994, you had an agreement of what we, what, what we call the Progressive Youth Alliance on a strategic position, on a strategic position, and therefore being able to influence that position within the ANC. Because for the first time since 1994, we saw young people within the ANC playing a very, very crucial role in advancing strategic positions within the ANC, arguing for nationalization, expropriation of, of land, and, and uh, the seven pillars of you know, economic freedom in our lifetime. And those particular ideas not only found expression within the ANC, they found expression throughout society. You had investors discussing nationalization, you had scholars you had uh, uh, professionals, you had other political parties as well. Therefore, restoring the ANC's position as you know, an advanced leader in shaping the ideas of society, even though the ANC did not agree with some of those policies, but it was a very important moment. And we know what happened in 2012 with the you know, disbanding of uh, you know, leaders of the ANC Youth League and all of that. That particular uh, generational mission was sort of left without a vanguard. And this is part of the fault of the progressive other organizations within the Progressive Youth Alliance, because they should have taken that particular beta and been the pole bearers of that particular generational mission. Because strategically, all the organization within the Progressive Youth Alliance agreed with that strategic objective of economic freedom in our lifetime. Now, what are the lessons to learn from this particular uh, historical analysis? One is that for young people to shape the ANC, they need to identify a particular mission. They need to identify strategic objectives, which shape the policies of the ANC and how it conducts itself. Secondly, they need to build a very strong support outside of the ANC of these particular ideas for them to be able to find expression within the ANC. Thirdly, they need to ensure that young people understanding these objectives that they would have set for themselves need to find expression within the leadership echelons of the ANC to shape that particular, uh, to ensure that that particular mission is safeguarded and it's advanced uh, appropriately. And lastly, is to ensure that those ideas that they bring restores the confidence of the ANC in society and therefore is able to galvanize its uh, support for the ANC, right? So nowadays, we, young people, particularly the Progressive Youth Alliance, is concerned on who must lead the ANC. Correctly so. We have always played that role of, you know, uh, sort of uh, being part of that discussion and that debate of who must lead the ANC. But however, there is no clear consensus on what those people we advocate for that must lead the ANC must pursue. What are the policies that they must pursue? What is the mission that they must drive? Our support for you know, leaders, as Comrade Karawa has said, is based on factions, is based on being bored. And therefore, that sort of anticip anticipates us or impedes us from playing our active role of shaping the ANC and ensuring that it, 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 it is accountable in its role of leading the National Democratic Revolution. We now just pick leaders simply because who's more popular, who has more rhetoric, who has, you know, who's more of a populist, who has more charisma, who has more money but there is no agenda behind this particular leaders. I'll give an example to make this point. You had the fees must fall and the roads must fall movement, which were very strong movements uh, in, 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 in South Africa post 1994. Arguably the most uh, uh, powerful and the most empty movements, youth movements uh, uh, since 1994. But because of its weaknesses and its concerns with the politics of the ANC factional politics, the Progressive Youth Alliance could not appropriately 
take full appreciation of that historic moment and therefore take a leadership role because we were divided on whom, who must lead and the factional politics. We could not agree as to what is it that you know, uh, we stand for. Is this not part of economic freedom in our lifetime? And therefore, if it is, what role must we play in shaping this movement? So those are some of the examples to say, if there are no ideas that shape the Progressive Youth Alliance uh, contribution in the ANC, we will fail to take a, a full sense of the historic moments that were presented with. Lastly, to make this point, uh, and I'm aware that uh, you know uh, my 20 minutes is, 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 is up, I'll just ask for five minutes to, to conclude. Uh, another example is that currently, as we are speaking, there are global developments that are happening, which seeks or suggests that the world order is changing. The world order as we know it is changing. What is the PYA's contribution in the position that the ANC must take within this changing world order? What is the a a Progressive Youth Alliance position on the kind of policies that we must pursue to take full advantage of the opp opportunities that are presented with this seemingly changing world order? Now, the last part, the second last part that I would like to speak about before I go to recommendations is what is the role, therefore, of the PYA within the renewal agenda of the ANC? That role one, it should be to shape the policies of the ANC and ensure that those policies are relevant and they speak to what the National Democratic Revolution is, is to ensure that the ANC in how it conducts itself and is in its outlook, it's representative of the interest of young people within the context of the National Democratic Revolution. Secondly, is to ensure that the leaders that are elected within the ANC are elected based on their capabilities to advance the mission that they would have defined as the most relevant mission to advance at a particular point in time within the current context of the material conditions we find ourselves internally and globally. And lastly, is to ensure that the ANC, particularly the Progressive Youth Alliance, becomes a legitimate representative of the people's aspiration in the context of the PYA, young people's aspiration, is to reassert the hegemony of the ANC, is to reassert the hegemony of the Progressive Youth Alliance. So for instance, you have a particular recommendations that the ANC, the PYA has made in its statement ahead of this conference in which it was speaking on renewal and it proposed very solid uh, you know, uh, 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 um, ideas on how this renewal should be. And I'll just mention a few. For instance, they mentioned that we propose that a branch must be in good standing if and only if it has paid up membership as outlined in the constitution, provides a credible record of activism in championing community struggles, holds regular branch meetings as contemplated in the constitution to report back and uh, uh, to report back and plan community campaigns, produce proof of continuous political education workshops. On the application of membership of the ANC, we advocate that before a member is confirmed a member in good standing, one, they should have been vetted to prevent sexual predators and criminals from joining the ANC and leading the ANC, must be assigned and, uh, must be assigned and fulfill community work tasks in line with the objectives of the ANC. They must provide regular reports to branch general meetings. They, this will assist in reconfiguring structures of the ANC into activist structures that center the people in their work. We also propose the following in terms of organizational redesign to measure improved efficiency. All NEC members must also have set functions to ensure all elected members are held accountable for positions they hold. All chairpersons of NEC, ANC, NEC subcommittees must be responsible for holding government employees accountable for the program of action of the ANC. This means that chairpersons of the ANC subcommittees must be full-time uh, employees of Lutuli House and not be in government. 
So that those are some of the propositions that the PYA has made, which brings me to my last part, the recommendations. Now the question is, is the PYA currently in a state to ensure that those things happen? Quite frankly, I don't believe we're sufficiently there. And I propose the following in order for us to be able to ensure that our proposals for the renewal agenda and that we effectively learn from the historical generations and successive generations from the formation of the ANC Youth League up until to date of the ANC and the contributions that were able to make, they, they were able to make. In order for us to effectively learn and effect and implement those lessons, one, the PYA must insulate itself from the factional politics of the ANC. And that means that they must fight for their autonomy. Secondly, in fighting for that autonomy and insulating itself, the PYA must be able to debate amongst its organization and have a consolidated view. So you cannot have the YCL singing a left tune where else the ANC Youth League is, right, is singing a right tune. We must consolidate our views and ensure that uh, when we go and lobby within the ANC, we are able to lobby for one and the same thing. Yes, we may, we may disagree on the tactics, but strategically we must be on an agreement. Thirdly, the PYA must ensure that once it has consolidated views, strategic views on the policies of the ANC and the direction that it must take, it is able to identify leaders amongst itself that are capable of safeguarding those particular interests and advancing those particular strategic objectives. So the ANC, uh, the PYA should say at this particular moment when we're going to conference, to say that we believe leader X and, X and Y must be within the top six officials because we want them to be able to advance one, two, three, four, including people in government. You have young people such as Comrade Karabo who are in government, such as Comrade Nompendulo and many other young progressive young people. But those young people are not accountable to the youth structures of the ANC. Because currently, the current state of the PYA is that some structures don't even have leadership. And they are not, we are not therefore able to even protect them against the old guard, which happens to be you know, very resistant of the ideas that we want to pursue. So if we ensure that we agree, we will be able to safeguard uh, these particular young people against attacks. And the last part I want to speak of is that for the Progressive Youth Alliance to play its active role, it must fight for the revival of the ANC Youth League so that it has a proper leadership, including all structures of the Progressive Youth Alliance. It must be able to fight that we must have an NEC of the ANC Youth League. It cannot be that uh, young people do not have correct leadership. They, they are you know, taken from one NYTT to another. No, we need proper structures so that we can be able to assert our authority. Last part is to say we must redefine what progressive means when we speak about the Progressive Youth Alliance. It cannot be that our definition of Progressive Youth Alliance is only based on youth organizations that support the ANC. It cannot be. We need to broaden our scope to say, there are other progressive youth organizations in society which are apolitical. How do we engage with those particular youth organizations? Some of them are even you know, within the ranks of opposition. But when you look at the ideas that they are pursuing, they are pursuing the strategic objectives of the National Democratic Revolution. And therefore, we need to find a way of saying, how do we infiltrate those particular organizations and try to win them over rather than just seeing them as opposition so that we can consolidate our support you know, throughout society? For example, how do we engage cultural organizations of artists? Why do we have Ama Piano as a cultural phenomenon which is influencing young people at a massive scale? And these people seem to be left, you know, uh, to be in an ideological and political pilot. 
where else the Progressive Youth Alliance could approach such uh, people to be able to quintentize them to the objectives of the National Democratic Revolution and safeguard their interests so that in their messaging influencing of young people, the ideas of the revolution could find expression. So that is my input, uh, Comrade JP. Lastly is to say thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. We present these ideas not in the notion of holding a monopoly of wisdom. So we are just positing some ideas which we hope will be further expanded on by people within the space and you know, throughout the movement, particularly young people, in order to help us rebuild the qualitative strength of the PYA within the ANC. Thank you very much. Uh, Comrade Kifenze, thank you, my leader. Uh, I think we shouldn't even waste any more time, comrades, but go straight to Comrade uh, Matlengi. Uh, thank you. I hope that you are ready for us. For me, I feel in many ways you're a person who really needs very little introduction, but uh, let me indicate nevertheless for uh, uh, everybody's benefit here that Comrade Matlengi, uh, at some point, uh, I nearly said the NYDA, uh, what did we call it then? The National Youth NYC and National, you correct me, Comrade Matling, if I'm getting this wrong. But I mean, she was the first, and National Youth Commission, yes. Comrade Matling was the first chairperson, by the way, of the National uh, Youth Commission, where at that time <clears throat> we were <clears throat> formalizing, legislatively speaking, space for young people to take the lead in championing their own cause. So, in many ways, really the right person to be addressing us today. She's been youth in that sense, and I still really consider her youth even up to today, but uh, you know, has uh, grown through the ranks of the organization where she is now, where I think that that Jenny has uh, prepared her well to be able to engage us on this day. She is the former uh, uh, um, Secretary General of SASCO, uh, when SASCO still had it, heads of head offices at West University there, um, uh, served on the NEC of the Youth League. She's a former executive director uh, of uh, core business at the legislature here in the in the province of Gauteng. Uh, uh, been working as a public and legislative consultant. Uh, serves on the council of VETS. She's a member of the VETS council. And importantly, I think for today, uh, is um, also a member of the ANC's renewal commission. As you would know, Comrades, that's the collective that we have tasked that they must come to us at national conference with a clear a program of action on when we say renewal, what are the things we're going to be doing against whatever plan into the future. So she's part of that collective and importantly also as well, my boss on this day, a board member of our Tambo School of Leadership. Uh, Tlengi, we are at your mercy for about the next 20 minutes and welcome. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, JP. Um, I do hope I am loud and clear for all comrades to hear. I am almost rounding off a conversation that I believe um, has been um, my input preceded by very strong interventions from my comrades, Comrade uh, Garabo, as well as Comrade Kifense. I think that Comrade uh, Karabo did a lot of foregrounding around the youth grievance, if I were to use that expression, in pointing us to some of those things that we need to um, look at in order to fully interrogate the renewal of the African National Congress, the renewal of society, the renewal of the state that we lead, as well as uh, and how to make sure that uh, issues of not just descriptive representation as well as substantive representation of young people is accomplished. Comrade uh, Kifenze, I felt that uh, um, being the last speaker did um, an amazing job at unpacking challenges before what we historically know as the Progressive Youth Alliance. I want to then whittle down to an aspect um, in the conversation so that all these three conversations 
and interventions or provocations come together nicely for the purposes of having a rich conversation after this. I wanted to then in that context, uh, Comrade JP and Comrades, really narrow my intervention on matters related to organizational re renewal in its uh, fuller sense. Speaking to what renewal is, speaking to what the current discourse around renewal is and the different variables that are being looked at to inform what it is that uh, the 55th National Conference of the ANC should uh, focus on or ought to debate. And maybe then ending off by highlighting or speaking to some of the key tasks, certainly from uh, this, uh, this perspective uh, and the topic of today, and taking into account the three critical questions that were posed to all of us when we were asked to be part of this platform. I start off by saying that, uh, you know, asking the question, how did the ANC get and, and how did the NC got to appreciate the need for organizational renewal? And, um, and what are those um, internal and external factors that have impacted the existence of the ANC necessitating the need to renew the ANC? And um, a, a sister of mine refers to them as the exogenous and endogenous uh, variables that impact the existence of the ANC as we know it today. And therefore confirming the accession by the Organizational Renewal Commission and initiated by the Veterans League of the ANC saying that the ANC currently faces an existential crisis. But before we recognize the fact that the ANC faces an existential crisis, we just need to also remind ourselves that the renewal or the idea of renewal is not new to the ANC. It's in the ANC's DNA actually. There have been successive renewal moments in the ANC, some of which have been covered by Congress that spoke before me and some of these date back to 1913 and before, uh, but in particular 1913, if you look at the struggles of women um, against pass laws, against beer halls, and uh, these were the women of the ANC. If you look at all the way to the 1940s, the renewal moments, including what's already been said, the founding of the ANC Youth League was a renewal moment to try and put a bit of fuel and speed in the struggle for liberation and uh, leading up to the 1949 program of action seeking to, um, um, and, and I think introduced more energy and agency around um, addressing challenges related to, or the struggle to ensure that African nationalism is, is uh, propelled all the way to the adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1955. And other landmarks, of course, would be what we all are well aware, well, are well aware of, which is the 1976 uprisings, um, young people taking center stage and uh, demonstrating the required impatience at the time to try and uh, free society and free South Africa anchored around the struggle for a decolonized education. And, um, and of course, we also know that some of the multipliers from that 1976 experience would then be young people swelling the ranks in the different pillars of our struggle, particularly the, the armed action and uh, young people swelling the ranks of Umkondo Wesizwe. And Umkondo Wesizwe, suddenly becoming very young, um, although you still had a lot of uh, senior and older comrades commanding um, that force. So the point we're making here uh, by way of, uh, of foregrounding my comments, uh, comrade chair, is to say that uh, indeed renewal is in the DNA 
of the ANC. It is not a new moment. There are new circumstances, there are new permutations, but it is not a new moment as we grab it by, by the bull by its horn. And I want to then move on to the point I raised about the existential crisis, which tries to explain why renewal is so urgent and what the rationale is for renewal. The NC is required to undertake an urgent, active and relentless moment of deep reflection and introspection. And part of the reason why we need to do that is uh, as we know it, there is a huge disconnect between the African National Congress of today and the people of South Africa. They, of course, uh, on the youth question, there's a massive disconnect between the African National Congress and the youth of South Africa, including the youth of the Congress. There is also a need as part of explaining this existential crisis for the ANC to undertake a conscious process of renewing our vows with the nation because the nation looks up to us as a trusted vehicle for a genuine transformation of society, as well as ensuring that uh, what we, the, the oath that we made, that we will deliver services to our people that can be achieved. And this is impossible to do in the context of the ANC, the current ANC. It is a moment of reflection. It is a moment of introspection. It is also a moment of circumspection. And I want to just underscore the point about circumspection where we talk about the leadership question in the ANC, the pedigree, the caliber, the ethos and the values that must undergird the selection of leaders in the ANC. So part of the circumspection has a lot to do with being mindful of how what society expects from the African National Congress. But to address the existential crisis and uh, address renewal requires that we also redefine and restate our values, our principles and our historical mission. And so renewal cannot be expressed outside of a full recommitment to the ideals of the national democratic revolution or to the goal of a national democratic society. And so it's important to talk about renewal in terms of all those indigenous and exogenous factors, but it must, we must always, I think, frame it around our historical struggle or our theory of struggle. And this is a point that I thought Comrade Giffense covered quite well. Renewal also though includes um, being punitive. Being punitive by closing the space for errant behavior and conduct. And here there is a lot to be said from what a member should be, a typical ANC member or an ideal ANC member should be, an ideal ANC branch should be, an ideal ANC, NEC, and all the way down to other levels should look like. It speaks to the types of policies and procedures that we need to have in order to renew the ANC. And of course, some of those we've already seen, uh, President Mutlante's uh, uh, electoral committee uh, being very upfront and being very strong in supporting the renewal effort by making it difficult, for example, for the use of money to be done willingly in order to influence election and selection of leaders in the ANC. Whether those um, injunctions uh, will yield an outcome that we all desire, let me say all, I mean those of us who are committed to an ethical and an upright ANC is uh, yet to be seen. But that just speaks to some of the elements that should constitute the renewal agenda of the African National Congress. And I flag the issue of the use of money because it implies that uh, those that don't have access to resources and more often than not, because we are now being candid in the conversation, are often those that have got access or uh, to some levers of state power, or those that have got access um, to some levers in the private sector. So this is an area that uh, constitutes 
uh, actions that needs to be punished via a set of clearly defined and are objective and they apply across the board, a set of policies and procedures. And this is just an example of the things we need to be doing in the renewal initiative to close the space for errant behavior as well as errant conduct. The step aside policy and, uh, and the flagging of those of us that do not leave the values of the ANC in our conduct, especially where we've been found by judicial institutions of our country to have uh, brought not just the country into disrepute, but the African National Congress into disrepute. So I speak to the, the agency of attending to the leadership question because even this whole idea of the renewal initiative will fall flat if it's not led by a committed leadership that is committed indeed to renewing the ANC because renewing the ANC perhaps begins now, but essentially begins after the 55th National Conference, assuming that the 55th National Conference will be resolute about uh, taking the required actions in this, this, in, in, in this instance. And then I think that one of the things I'd really like to put forward is what one of the, uh, the renewal commission's perspective has been that when all of these things of a reflection and introspection, a conscious process of renewing our vows and our commitments should then lead to a redesign of the organization, both in terms of shape, form, and content. And hopefully I've spoken to elements related to form, and I would hope to expand this as we move forward. I also want to say, as I conclude on this point around what is the logic behind renewal and what is this existential crisis we're also talking about, to say that uh, part of centering young people in the renewal agenda is for this renewal of effort to acknowledge that we have a youthful uh, African population, South African population, and that uh, that needs to be the, the well, the source from which economic development um, flows in a variety of sectors. Of course, other areas related to social inclusion and representation and so on, but just in terms of growing our economy, tapping into the youth agency in the various aspects and the domains in the economy, from the green economy all the way to um, the digital space and basically harnessing South Africa's and Africa's potential. Part of the reason why we must do this is because the ANC in South Africa must regain its status as the moral conscience of humanity. Certainly that is part of our history. We have been, if you look at our internationalism, our type of internationalism, it's always been to stand with those that are vulnerable, those that are marginalized, because we know this too well through our own struggle. Now, having said that, comrades, I want to then move on to say, based on all of these problems that we've highlighted and problems that are being analyzed within the ANC, within the Alliance and the wider democratic movement. And I'm quite excited to listen to Comrade Gifense talking about how we need to reconfigure the P P PYA because I also don't believe that uh, the PYA as we historically knew it, and most of us would have been founding members of uh, the PYA, um, whether really we can um, walk, uh, we can continue to think of the PYA in, in that sense, we would have missed a historical moment to hegemonize the politics of the ANC among young people. And so there is a conversation to be had around what is the future PYA looking like? I want to then turn to the work of the commission because I would be remiss in my role today without talking about the work of the commission so that it is also put under the scalpel in this discussion. The ANC sets up the Organizational Renewal Commission sometime early uh, um, the second quarter of, of this year. 
And the commission is tasked with crafting the 2032 vision and developing a roadmap to get us there and to get us there and beyond. I want to just highlight some of the few points or some of the few postulations that the commission has put forward as it works towards putting together the 2032 vision and the associated uh, roadmap. So some of these variables or some of these postulations form part of the scenario planning approach that the commission um, adopted to be able to deliver on its mandate. A number of variables have been identified and I want to lift some of these because they're quite relevant to the conversation today. So the one I wish to speak to relates to the commission saying, as a commission, we note that ideological contestation is getting more and more intense. And that speaks to ideological contestation across the world. If you look at our geopolitical situation, it also speaks to ideological contestation in South Africa. And I think we can all speak to a number of examples around the use of extremist language around uh, uh, right-wing mobilization um, around, for example, the flourishing of formations uh, and a good example such as uh, the solidar um, uh, um, um, solidarity and many others. So this is one of the variables that are going to shape and impact the future when we work on the 2032 vision. The future role and nature of the state is also being debated. And I think there, um, comrades, that's, that's quite a, 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 a lot that sits within that particular variable related to the role of the state and whether the state is capable, whether the state is ethical, and whether the state is developmental. The question of women and the centering of women um, also coming in into the fore, looking at the need to develop a women's social economic justice agenda. Of course, issues related to existential threats that are facing humanity from pandemics to climate change and all of those related issues. And then of course, the issue of climate change, the energy crisis, the impact of technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, the future of our own economy. And um, there is no gain saying there, we've recently just been through the, the medium term uh, budget policy statement. We can tell that uh, the uh, prospects of growth are next to nil um, in the coming years as we head up, head, head up to, to 2032. Challenges related to the skills shortfall in our country, and the extent to which this affects the youth agenda. I want to now really focus on the variable that is being hugely debated um, in terms of solutions, the moribund quality of political leadership in society, not just in the ANC, but in society. And of course, in, in, in South Africa, as well as uh, in the African National um, Congress, uh, quality that is seen not to be responsive, is seen not to be ethical, is seen not to be competent, uh, all of those um, aspects impacting that particular variable. The state of opposition parties, including, of course, the matter of coalitions and uh, the coalitions that we are part of and those that uh, are going to be impacting um, our hegemony in the state going forward. I won't go into all of the variables. I'm, I'm, I'm certain that by now, uh, comrades would have a sense of some of those uh, points that are being debated by the Organizational Renewal Commission, the focus groups that it has been holding, the interviews that are currently taking place with individual members and leaders of the ANC, and the fact that uh, one of the key variables is the fact that the ANC is seen as currently working more as a political party than a liberation movement. And so that whole nexus between uh, the ANC as a party and the ANC as a, 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 a movement of liberation and, and whether we need to re reflect 
on that as part of formulating the 2032 vision. One of the postulations say that young people should enjoy greater focus. And therefore the 2032 vision, if it has got to have any meaningful uh, um, contribution to the ANC beyond the 55th national conference would be determined by the extent to which it is youth centric. And so there's quite a lot of that. And I think my comrades have covered that. A big challenge, of course, is the fact that uh, if poverty, unemployment, and inequality, um, in fact, um, many comrades will say these are no longer triple challenges, but quadruple challenges, including the challenge of corruption, are not addressed. Um, clearly, 2032 would be a dire state of affairs when we get there. The ANC in South Africa remains a patriarchal society. We can pick up this conversation during discussion in the interest of time, comrades. And of course, the last three that I just want to speak to speaks to the need to rethink spatial development, uh, the transformation of the rural and the urban space in a way that ensures inclusion, both social and economic inclusion of our people, particularly people that have been historically dispossessed. And then um, the, the need to sort out and this is more of an endogenous matter, the need to sort out the poor party and state nexus. So the ANC as a party and how the ANC um, influences the policies and practice and behavior of the South African state needs to be handled better. And the final one being again, another endogenous matter that is internal to the ANC, which is a, a sense that an ANC hybrid model emerges. In other words, the branch of the ANC as we know it, possibly being challenged to renew or re get re redesigned as part of one of the organizational redesign uh, proposals that are likely to emerge from the work of the commission, uh, but are going to be influenced by all of these consultations that are currently underway a hybrid branch a, a, that emerges, allowing for branches that are more robust, but also have a closer connection with the different sectors uh, in, in our society, as well as sectors that operate in the, in, in the economic space. The unresolved land question will continue to haunt the ANC. This is another variable that has been uh, flagged by the work of, of the commission of course, the other being the international aspects, the Africa and geoeconomic alignments, as well as South African leadership um, on, on in, in, the, in the continent. So I, I just speak to those comrades uh, as a way of uh, um, um, making this particular intervention so that we take those into account when we discuss the youth question, and we're not discussing the youth question in isolation of the economic question, in isolation of geopolitics and all other things that are going to be impacting the future, impacting the future both in terms of their impact as well as in terms of their certainty or their uncertainty. So these are some of the things that have been flagged and highlighted in the work of the Renewal Commission. I look forward to an engagement today that uh, unpacks some of these, informs some of these, interrogates some of these, and highlights some of the gaps in the work of the commission to date. Now, turning back to the issue of young people, we note that young people have got very diverse features. So if you were to look at the millennials, the Gen Zs and the Alphas, you will note that these are generations of young people that were born and operated um, during time periods that presented sometimes different sets of challenges. And that uh, if uh, the whole thing about centering young people in the renewal effort, and, and I emphasize it's the renewal of society by renewing the ANC because the ANC doesn't belong to the ANC, the ANC belongs to the people of South Africa. So if we renew the ANC, we are doing it so that we can provide the required leadership 
to society. And so it's important that we are very clear about how we characterize young people, what their features are, and the different generations, all the way from those that were born when you know, technology was taking shape and those that were born where you know, the very much um, immersive experiences around the world of internet and technology, um, all the way to uh, discourses around climate change and, um, and also the very much uh, of uh, the, the latter years generation of young people often referred to as the alphas, um, born uh, and, and known as the, the true digital natives expected to be the most transformative generation ever, uh, having been born in a world saturated uh, with uh, different ways and different innovations across the world. And we've seen this happening in our country. When we unpack the, the, the reality of young people and how this impacts renewal, we know that there's evidence of uh, what we will refer to as an intergenerational disconnect. We know that there's evidence of that. Uh, it's evidenced in successive declines in voter participation, especially among young people, um, a decline in youth agency, particularly where things related to crime, substance abuse, and how these um, have impacted uh, the trauma that is felt among some of our young people. We also know that uh, the big issue around identities and um, related to the failure by society and by the ANC to develop a coherent intersectional perspective in terms of how we look at young people. Gone are the days when we talked about young people in the context of male and female. So we've been lagging behind um, in understanding how evolved that discourse is globally, including in our own country, in civil society, and the ANC has been found napping where that is concerned, understanding the challenges that are faced by young women in, an, in their intersectional con connectedness, young women and young men uh, coming in um, both as men and women coming in as gays, lesbians, queer, intersectional, transgender, and other communities. Um, intersectionality in terms of looking at uh, ableism and colorisms, all of those things that impact the full inclusion and participation, representation, both descriptive and substantive representation of young people. And so this is one of the things that we need to be pushing. And uh, we, the, you know, I can say, from the work of the commission, this has been uh, coming forward quite strongly. And then of course, there's also a, a, a very challenging conversation and Comrade Garabo spent a lot of time on this, which is, and we said there's a push for retirement. So I'm not even be going to begin to unpack it because I thought that has already been done by the earlier speakers. But as a way there's push for retirement for, um, the elderly of older leaders um, that are over the age of 65 as a concrete way of giving expression um, and allowing for uh, the learnings, the trans uh, handing over of the baton in terms of leadership and in terms of roles of young people within the African National Congress. I know that uh, uh, the national chair of the ANC re referred to this as a negative marking, but uh, it was a necessary provocation from the, 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 the renewal commission. Now we need to avoid having this debate degenerating uh, to what is now, uh, what is perceived as an, a, an emerging tendency of, of the conversation needs to be mediated a bit better. And I thought some of the interventions earlier were beginning to help us in that direction, but I do look forward to hearing what Congress have to say. Um, I would uh, refer to it as intergenerational solidarity and creating a world for all ages and maybe ascribing roles to those that uh, um, have experience and have come before us in order to allow for um, repurposing the ANC and ensuring that we inject youth leadership 
both in terms of form as well as in terms of content. And of course, we have already spoken about the fact that young activists in townships and villages are also adopting and adapting to new technologies that uh, has the potential of uh, leading to expansion of job creation and self-employment and other decent work opportunities. Um, it is, however, felt that the education system remains less transformed in the face of the changing nature of work. Um, the ANC, and this is the second last point on this, the ANC being seen as disconnected from and disinterested in young people, not seen as articulating youth issues, absent from the struggles of youth, um, high levels of graduate unemployment, seen as an example of that, Factional battles um, in the mother body being replicated in youth structures, and as well as the youth league, um, should see the future of the country reimagined away from the current environment and not just the ANC Youth League, the entire Progressive Youth Alliance. Then the last point on this would be that uh, um, again, young people are also facing this ideological contestation where a lot of extremist language is being used to recruit. Um, young people, especially in the campuses. And uh, you know, a good example that is often used is uh, the language that says Mandela sold out. Um, in our context, that would amount to an extremist language of mobilizing young people. Um, but it is on us to understand why it is that uh, such a, a, a strong narrative emerges uh, among young people uh, particularly among young people in higher education, this would be quite one of those statements that are often um, uttered. About the Progressive Youth Alliance, there is no gainsay that the PYA is, uh, is vital and that uh, you know young people have always historically been a significant feature in the development of movements and uh, the liberation movement in South Africa. Now, I want to really try and round this uh, up, Comrade JP, and pick on those aspects that may not have been covered by other comrades or emphasize some of them. Now, the PIA, the PIA was set up to rally young people. And I think all of us that have been part of this movement uh, of both the student movement from COSAS to SASCO, um, to, to the ANC Youth League, to the Young Communist League, Ufa Simba, and uh, to many other youth formations. We know that uh, the PYA has always been that energizing force, has always been a revol revolutionizing force. Doesn't suggest that young people are revolutionary by inherently. It's a function of ideological development. But we know that the energy of young people has uh, taken our country to where it is today. We remember the formation of COSAS 1979, also triggered by the 1976 uprisings. And you can already see how the relay happens and the baton happens. We recall the formation of the South African Student Congress, SASCO, of course, preceded by its forebears, the South African Student Organization in 1968, Zaso in, 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 in 1979, the South African National Student Congress, and of course, the National Union of South African um, Students and USAS, all of these um, culminating into the watershed measure of SANSCO and USAS in September 1991. We also know about the struggles waged by all of these student formations, both in terms of the national democratic struggle but also more singular struggles uh, aimed at decolonizing, enabling access and freeing up our education system. We also know about the ANC Youth League all the way to from its formation in 1944 and its revolutionizing agenda leading to the program of action in 1949, the 1976 struggles as all the way to 1985 and beyond. Now, the Young Communist League gets set up, actually gets relaunched in the country um, following its banning uh, back in the day and gets relaunched for the same reason, to engender and to advocate 
for a left perspective and for a working class driven youth development agenda. Questions we should be asking today is whether all of these formations have helped us to get to a point where we should be getting. I was also quite encouraged by the unpacking done by Comrade Kefense on the fact that when we wage struggles, whether it's on campuses or wherever, we've always relied on a broad front, progressive front, whether it was the faith based um, organ student organizations, the Hindu Students Association, where I came from, University of Devon, Westville, um, our struggles were always anchored and rallied together with Hindu Student Association, the Muslim Student Association in many campuses, both um, black as well as uh, liberal campuses and uh, countless others that uh, existed, the young Christian students, Suka and many others. That is how we were able to hegemonize the youth and the student um, uh, mobilization space. And I, I yearn for a time when we, when we talk about repositioning young people in the ANC and rebuilding the depleted and the eroded structures. And it's essentially one or two structures are standing and they're standing again on thin ice. If you look at all these student formations that belong to the PYA or historically belonged to the PYA. So quite clearly, both young people themselves need to own that uh, uh, the, the, the state of erosion. Um, elder, older people need to own the state of erosion because we also know that older and senior leaders have also contributed the decimation that we see of the ANC Youth League and many of the formations that ordinarily would historically form part of Youth Alliance. I conclude by then uh, speaking quickly to the key tasks. I think the, the need to urgently bring the debate around the intergenerational disconnect to some sort of argument is urgent. It's a polarized debate at the moment. And one would hope that as we approach the fifth, fifth national conference, there must be a, a, an emerging a, a, a perspective around which uh, most of our structures and, and uh, friends of the ANC and allies of the ANC could coalesce. But also when we talk about representation of young people, I think we need to talk about it both in terms of in descriptive terms, as well as uh, on a much more substantive level, in terms of youth leadership in managing climate change or addressing climate change, youth leadership, in, in dealing with a whole the, the, the just transition and all other socioeconomic challenges uh, we are facing. And that is why I refer to a substantive representation. The second task that I want to address, whether we it is a youth leader or any other leader in the ANC that leads the ANC into the future to implement the 2032 vision and its roadmap. I think that we need to emphasize then the, the ideal of humanizing leadership. One of the things that we're coming across in our engagements with structures, including those that are not members of the ANC, because it's important for the work that we're doing to renew the ANC for us to speak to critical voices as well, is just one injunction that can you just humanize leadership of the ANC and humanize ANC deployees in the state. And part of humanizing simply means being relatable, being accessible, working with our communities, and uh, just being there on the ground and uh, making sure that uh, it is an ANC and an ANC leadership and ANC deployees that have a full appreciation of the task before them, and but understand that these cannot be done in a way they, where there is a, a huge distance, as we see it, between the leaders in government and the communities that, um, that are supposed to work with this leadership. Of course, the third one has already been seriously iterated about rebuilding the youth movement. And I think along the lines of what has been put forward, rebuilding the youth movement and really going out and not focusing only just on uh, SASCO, the ANC Youth League, COSAS, YCL, the Young Women's Desk, really beginning to map 
young people in their formations in South Africa today, beginning to understand young people that are operating in civil society spaces and are doing a better job than ourselves in, in those spaces. Ideological development, whether you elect a young person um, a, or an, an, an older person, I mean, in fact, a young person or is very dangerous. And so it's important that uh, we are very, very deliberate around that. And uh, these were covered by Comrade Garabo as well, emphasis on really rolling out ideological development work and specifically political education, not only on a demand basis, but she used the word in mass. I want to just uh, then leave it at that because I do think that issues related to identifying our generational mission as young people, articulating it very clearly as we go to the 55th National Conference, mobilizing around it and manifesting it. And then based on that saying, what is the type of leadership we need for us to realize this generational mission? And uh, Chair, I have I've done that. I end off by just uh, invoking the words of uh, Professor Moshen Kondo who often would say in these uh, renewal commission conversations that the ANC is known for its strong explanatory power. In other words, we have a, a gazillion of ideas about what ought to happen. We've codified it into policies and so on. But where the key challenge for renewing the ANC lies, lies in behavior. And I want to leave uh, yourselves with that question, comrades, around what it is that we are going to do beyond explanatory power. We can write up a nice vision statement, but how is it that through the renewal effort and through the future vision, are we going to basically reinstall or reassert the types of behaviors that are required for the ANC to continue being called the leader of society? Thank you very much, comrade chair. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. In fact, thank you to all the uh, our three speakers, Comrade Carabo, Comrade Kefense, and Comrade Matlengi as well. I think uh, quite a an, an enriched inputs looked at collectively, uh, comrades, touching on an array of uh, areas. Uh, I do know. I think in particular, comrades like Comrade Tipo Kazi were a bit skeptical about us trying to have three speakers worried about time. And I also see now that we literally are left with only about nine minutes of uh, engagement if there's gonna be any. So I am going to appeal to you that we extend to quarter past two if there are any hands from uh, yourselves, but we don't really go beyond that time. Uh, preferably for me, we should still be finishing by two, but at the most uh, we could extend it up to about quarter past two there's a comment, and maybe let me add to that, uh, comrades, before you speak, remember last week we were also saying part of our own training in, in this space is just to learn to be articulate and be to the point on the view you want to raise. So I'm going to appeal to you that if you speak, if you please do not go beyond three minutes in whatever is the specific point or the question you want to raise. There is a comment uh, I see in the chat group, engagement has been going on there, which we certainly very, very much uh, uh, encourage. Uh, this is meant to be a dialogue where we share thinking with each other and try to enrich one another in the end. But I see there's a comment here from Comrade Confi, uh, uh, Dr. Estras Co Confidence Muloko. Uh, Comrade Confi says that I have followed many an intergenerational and intersectional debates and found myself very disappointed. Uh, no, no, sorry, that's not the one I wanted to read. Uh, Come comfy. There's another one, and I think it also comes from you. Um, yes, it says, uh, and then he addresses this to Comrade Karabo, who unfortunately, as, as I indicated at the beginning, couldn't be with us until up to the end, because she had to run to another engagement. But Comrade Confi here was saying that uh, uh, Comrade Karabo spoke of the generational discourse, uh, which is fine. He says that, however, Many of us who have grown up in the ANC under the ANC leadership collective, added by Comrade O.R. Tambo, were constantly taught and reminded that every structure of the ANC 
must comprise of a balanced team in terms of age, gender, creed, race, and class. We were taught that this mix is critically important as the youth are the energy of the ANC and the elders its wisdom. We were also taught that leadership is earned and never demanded or bestowed. And then he asks, uh, what is your response, uh, comrade? I mean, this one I did pick, comrades, because I think it also relates to the point Comrade Matlengi was making about what, should, what used to be the complexion of your PYA at a particular moment as a formation, which essentially was mobilizing across a broad range of sectors, young people around our uh, ultimate agenda of a national democratic society. And what it looks like today, uh, uh, and even the, the, the very effort of in inclusivity. I mean, I think during the week, I saw a video on WhatsApp with the president walking around with these two other gentlemen who are white, who were in ANC regalia. So one would assume that they themselves probably are members of the organization. And there were those who were, uh, uh, you know, they were but scornful about this and questioning that why is he talking to white people? Uh, talking to me again about this notion of inclusivity, of understanding that the way we need to position ourselves and the way we need to be operating uh, as a, a, a parliament of the people, right? That these people of South Africa uh, really stretches across race, creed, uh, religious beliefs, and uh, all of these different uh, isms even that you could ever find. Um, uh, 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 one just thinks that it's one of those very interesting, maybe in itself it's a discussion what we need to have at some point around the subject of inclusivity, but in this case specifically, in the space of young people, what it means, and even for the PYA. Comrade Kofi, I'm only seeing your hands. I'm only going to recognize that and then see from our speakers if they have any concluding remarks. And I'll probably end today's uh, dialogue on that note. Okay, there's a hand of Comrade Dumelo as well. Comrades, I'm not going to take any hands after this. Uh, I will give each of these comrades uh, say about uh, 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 Comrade Selo di Tebe. Okay, those will be the only speakers. Comrade Kofi, you first. Then Comrade Tumelo next, uh, and then co uh, followed by Comrade Sello. Please uh, switch on your, your camera when you speak. Comrade Comfy. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Comrade, uh, comrade uh, um, uh, uh, JP, and uh, all the comrades that are on the platform. Um, I'll try and be very, very short. The one small thing that I, I would just like to propose at a, at a very practical level, and I think that maybe uh, the comrades will be able to respond on it, is that because we cannot talk about the organizational renewal of the ANC with a very weak student and the youth contingent, one of the biggest problems that is there within our youth and student movement today, is the problem of people fighting over material things. Um, you end up with a situation where people who are not necessarily learners will be the ones that are leading causes. And uh, what they enjoy are the fruits of being in the leadership and being able to have access to resources. Now, in our days when we were in Azaso in the late 70s, uh, early, uh, early 80s, what we agreed with as students and youth was that the learners in uh, schools will be organized by courses and all the leaders of courses will belong to a specific school. The students in colleges and universities would be organized by Azaso. And everybody who comes into the colleges and universities would be a member of Azaso. The youth and students would be organized in communities. And all the people who come from communities as members of the youth, when they go to schools, they would become members of COSAS. And where COSAS does not exist, they would form a COSAS. And the same with Azaso. And those that come from the communities, when they go to colleges and universities, they would be members of Azaso. So there was no battle 
for the turf and battle for influence. The last thing is that all the youth and students used to be supplied with a manual, which we used to call the organizing manual of SACTU. And all of them were organizing uh, the unorganized people into the general unions like SAU. If that were to be done today, I'm definitely sure that our youth and students would have the necessary political education and ideological training, and they would not fight for the spaces where they are organizing and the student and the youth movement would be very strong. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Confi. Comrade Tumelo. Please switch on your camera here. Yes, we have three minutes, Comrade Tumelo. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Chairperson. Uh, what a comprehensive uh, presentation by our, our presenters. Uh, how do you speak after that? Uh, a wonderful presentation. Um, you know the the genesis of a of of renewal. I mean, it will it would set a in motion a a, a motion that will that will uh, make things happen for 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 the ANC uh, generally. You know, because uh, that will that will make uh, that uh, uh, for public erosion that has been uh, that has been uh, done uh, over the past years, um, I mean public confidence in in, in our uh, in our movement. I think the the public the the youth formations which play very important role. I mean. And look at our youth information, and if we uh, uh, articulate uh, uh, people like that, I think uh, we are in the right uh, direction. And uh, I think we should uh, guard against uh, our our comrades in the. Uh, I mean, we should we should be uh, doing this uh, renewal uh, uh, thing uh, correctly. I mean, uh, we we all know that the the uh, the you know social media plays a very important role uh, nowadays, and if it plays a very important role, there are some uh, some uh, some sometimes when uh, the social media indict the 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 the, the, the organization in, in terms of what it, what it portrays. So we need our our members to be beyond reproach. I mean, uh, in nowadays, I mean, even if uh, an information is not uh, correct, but because it's out there, uh, it it makes a, a dent in our in our uh, in our uh, move, in our uh, organization. And uh, one other thing uh, that was touched on is that uh, we. We really need the the the, the all all uh, all the youth uh, all all the all hands on deck in terms of uh, renewal. I mean, the renewal uh, process starts individually. It starts with us. I mean, uh, protein the the kind of uh, organization that we understand uh, to be reflected out there. And uh, lastly, uh, I want to say that. Uh, we, I think, we should challenge the the global north in terms of uh, what it uh, uh, what it comes up with uh, to the global south in terms of the the policies that the the uh, they forge they, they forge uh, there and then it comes to us. I mean, it should reflect the the challenges of the of the youth, and I think if 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 that can be done, um, uh, that will be. Um, okay, for that, that will be a, a step in the right direction. And uh, lastly, um, I think the the, the we, we we need, like I said, we need all the people uh, to 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 do the, their bit. I mean, 
this is an opportunity time for us to to make the right uh, uh, to, to make the wrongs uh, right. I think if we can hold hands together, we can achieve more. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thanks very much, Comrade Tumelo. Comrade Silo, you're on the floor. Comrade Silo, please unmute. Thank you. And please switch on your camera. Uh yeah, I'm not at home. I'm actually uh, on the streets. I'm, I'm working uh, on something here, but I'll switch on the camera, of course, if you want. Uh, is it okay? <laughs> uh, if no, you I can don't just mind. see you briefly, Lid, it's fine. I can just see you. Yeah, briefly. okay. Please. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Comrade JP. Uh, and indeed, I must thank uh, all the presenters. Um, um, I missed the first presenter because we had some load shedding issues, uh, but um, I, I heard uh, the uh, presentation being um, cited uh, and, and the salient aspects thereof. Um, so I caught the tail end of Comrade Giffenze, but of course listened to everything that Comrade Mashengi said. Uh, I agree. I agree with a whole lot of things that she has said. Uh, two or three things that emerge from what has been raised in the presentations. Uh, the first one, let me begin with what Comrade Masengi has referred to as intergenerational solidarity. Uh, I agree with uh, the proper coinage of words so that these words themselves should not be used against our own movement. And, and she indeed that uh, some extremist language is being used such as Mandela sold out, even this one of uh, the gap in, in generations uh, can be uh, a mutually destructive. Um, you know, those of us that know about um, your Alzheimer's, dementia and so forth, we will talk of autodegenerative diseases. It's something that uh, perhaps could be akin to that. If you look at the fact that members of the same organization who in, inhabit the same realm will be talking past each other. Uh, you know, some saying you're too young, some saying you're too old, et cetera. And I do think we need to bring, uh, to bridge that chasm uh, between generations because there is absolutely nothing wrong. For example, with uh, Comrade Confi, he has played his role. He was a young person at one, at one stage, Comrade Masengi, myself, yourself, and many other comrades. Um, and I think, those of our comrades and Comrade Masengi has referred to the age structure of our population, South Africa, and in, indeed by extension, the African continent. But um, the uh, age cohorts of uh, these two uh, groups, so to speak, must not be seen as mutually uh, antagonistic. We should see young people as, as, as potentially being capable of imbibing pearls of wisdom uh, from the, the older generation. And that takes me to the next point that Comrade Masengi raised. Um, at what point, for example, do we say, we retire you, Comrade Sillo? Uh, I'm not saying we should import it wholesale, but if you look at what the Chinese Communist Party is doing just in terms of uh, the participation of different age cohorts within the structures of the Communist Party, even in government, uh, they've got some limits. Um, 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 but that presupposes that um, uh, Giffen's uh, or Garabo, whoever, would have played a role on an interrupt, uninterrupted basis within the organization, thereby, thereby gaining immense experience. So that at the point of us saying, we think that, you know, at 67, 70 or whatever, that's why I'm saying, let's not simply import it wholesale. Let's look at our own situation, um, our own demographics, uh, our own political economy and everything else that is important to take into account. And then go, go for example, revisit that part in the strategy and tactics on intergenerational uh, uh, mix of leadership. Uh, see if we can tweak it a little more uh, so that there is further clarity uh, as to what it is that is expected of anyone and everyone who is a member of the ANC, including cadres of the ANC, so that th there is no um, attempt to um, label people merely on the basis of, of age, etc. 
I dare say that if you take a party, for example, like the ACDP, purely on narrow, fanatical, religious grounds, you're likely to have a young person that is much more reactionary, much more reactionary than an older person of 65, 70 years in the ANC, who throughout their participation in the life of the ANC would have imbibed this progressive uh, uh, a streak uh, of, 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 of politics within the ANC. Um, similarly, I would say in the EFF, if you look at them, anything and everything today, they are socialist. Tomorrow, you know, they are speaking in reverential terms about monarchy and, and all of that. Uh, tomorrow, they are something else. So, and, and that means, that means, comrades, that if you look at our PYA, um, because of the um, lack of political and ideological clarity, uh, and, and I'm speaking in general terms, they are likely to be uh, uh, tempted, tempted to mimic uh, the EFF of this world. Uh, you know, that relies on bombast and all of that um, and bluster and so forth. So it, it's important what Comrade Mashengi says, uh, that we need to anchor ourselves on absolute political and ideological clarity right across the board, but in particular, uh, because we have the dividend of, of youth in our ranks. Um, that's th those are the parts, uh, the points that I needed to raise. But, but um, with regards to, for example, the point that Comrade Confi raised, in well, fact, Comrade so Confi, you need to yeah, end up the, the exterior. last one, yes, the last one. In fact, in the free state, I'm told you have somebody who works in the office of the premier who leads Sasco. He's not a full-time student. And I think the PYA needs to cleanse itself and say, what is it that motivates us to have such situations? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Okay, so to our speakers, I'm going to invite you perhaps another two minutes concluding remarks. Uh, let me start with you, Kefense. Uh, just two minutes, please, just in conclusion. Uh, thank you very much, Comrade. Uh, again, appreciate the, invitation, the space, comrades that have engaged our presentations, uh, and hopefully these conversations will continue and not end here. And uh, maybe, of course, to also apologize uh, for the time because normally, you know, would leave sufficient time for engagements. So we truly apologize, Comrade JP uh, um, And just to sum up the conversation by saying, I think we all agree that ANC's renewal is intertwined with PYA's renewal. And in fact, history teaches us that for the ANC to effectively renew itself and you know, save itself from uh, whatever threats that, you know, threaten its existence. It has always relied on the energy of the youth. And therefore, up until the PYA is able to renew itself, we can never fully realize the renewal of the ANC. So the renewal of the ANC is predicated on a very strong renewed PYA. Secondly, is to say the issue about the intergenerational solidarity, it must happen on, of course, the political, ideological, and strategic objectives of the NDR. We cannot simply have a solidarity that is on, you know, uh, that is just floating. It has to be solidarity that is directed by particular objectives of the PYA. And lastly, to say the PYA is very central. And in renewing itself, it must also bring back the internationalist outlook. For instance, in the session, Comrade JP, we have one to Misang Mahesu, who is leading the student, South African student, uh, South African International Student Association in Russia. We need to be able as the PYA to communicate with such people firsthand so that we're able to also organize young people who are outside of the country and prepare them to come back and play an active role in advancing the national democratic uh, revolution. Thank you very much, Comrade JP. Thank you very much to the comrades. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kvente. Uh, Klengi, uh, some three minutes to you, please, in conclusion. Okay, just uh, thank you, Comrade JP. I want to um, go to the one thing about 
um, Comrade Silo says the PYA needs to cleanse itself. I can't agree more. You know, when we talk about youth agency, we are not talking about young people that are helpless. We're talking about young people that have experienced in different degrees, some level of uh, the, the democratic dividend. So we're talking about young people that are already occupying certain sites of, of, uh, of power. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, it will be important for us to be very, um, I think emphatic on this point. I wanna use an example of um, where a student leadership or student organization um, decides to serve on the procurement processes of a university where you have leaders that would serve. And I speak now where, with a, a bit of emotion because uh, I'm, I'm a former Secretary General of SASCO, where student leaders would actually want to serve on supply chain management committees in a university in order to influence the outcome of the tenders of the university. I think those are some of the practical things we need to dispense with if we hope to renew the PIA, because the use of money that we talk about in the ANC is manifesting and trickling down across the board. So I do think that when we talk about the issue of the agency of young people and young leaders and student and youth organizations, we really need to do a little bit of looking inward as well, as well as looking into the ANC, but also looking inward. Um, there are many examples that we can speak about, because if we don't say these things to each other as comrades, we're going to talk about them outside. And part of the reason why we're losing uh, some of the support in, in various institutions of learning, um, I don't know whether it has to do with uh, whether we've become part of the system or part of the patronage system um, in various campuses. And, and I just want to leave it at that in the interest of time. I'm happy for a debate in, in, in the future because these are the things that are really concerning. And then that's the, 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 the one uh, just a provocation as we walk away from the platform. And then the other one is um, this idea that when you're talking about intergenerational um, solidarity, it should be anchored on the NDR. I think that uh, is, is um, supposed to be a given, but it's not always a given. Uh, and so even as we elect older or younger or middle-aged leaders, it must really be on their basis, the basis of their capability, their competence, their values, and also importantly, they are committed, their commitment to the achievement of the, 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 the goals of the National Democratic Revolution. And I would take it further to say their commitment towards ensuring the upliftment of the conditions or addressing the conditions of the working class and the poor. I would want to use that test, whether it was a young person or not. And it, it's important to do so because uh, tomorrow you may elect Matlengi, 26 year old, um, vibrant, comes in and work against the interests of the most vulnerable sections of our society. I just want to leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. Thanks very much, in fact, to our speakers. I know Comrade Karabo is not with us here, but Comrade Kifens and Matlengi are here. So I do want to conclude today's session, uh, comrades, on this note. Thank also to all of you for being party uh, to this session. We are continuing tomorrow, uh, next week, not tomorrow. We are continuing. Next week, same time, 12 p.m., uh, continuing this uh, conversation around other thematic areas that relates to the ANC uh, renewal uh, in the hopes that between us here, we engage and then we go into our other platforms. We take whatever we uh, learn here from others to share elsewhere. Uh, but also this material is available on the Oak Tambo School's uh, Facebook page. This is streamed live there. It will also be uh, put on the website, I think also on YouTube. So you are able to come back to all of this material at a later point within your branches, within your different spaces uh, where you're engaging uh, comrades. Use this as your background uh, 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 content, background uh, input and expand on it. You know, Come back to the Facebook page, make your comments there, 
because uh, it is in this fashion that we will continuously sharpen our thinking and find those solutions that are really most appropriate uh, to our movement and ultimately our uh, country and above all also in shaping the type of world that we all want to be living in. So on that note, I want to thank all of you uh, and wish you a restful Saturday uh, moving forward. I had a Sunday, I wish you a restful Sunday forward if you still have the space to be able to do that. Uh, uh, and uh, best of luck into the week. Amanda. Thank you, thank you for